All right, so the minor prophets for beginners, uh, majoring in minors, this is lesson number two in that series. And the title of this lesson is The Call of the Prophet, The Call of the Prophet. The uh, Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament, both the major prophets and the minor prophets, can seem as great examples to uh, build a faith and courage steadfastness to all of God's servants in any age. I mean, I don't know how many people have preached on the prophets since the prophets were alive to draw lessons and to draw applications for their own life of, uh, of faith. Uh, even though this series of lessons will focus on the, just on the minor prophets, similar lessons can be taken from the major prophets as well, whose life experience as prophets were for the most part similar to the minor prophets. You know, the minor prophets, the major prophets, we get you know, hung up with, the, with those terms. They were all prophets. They all had the similar experience. They had similar responsibilities. Uh, and we can draw, my point is, we can draw similar lessons from both major minor uh, prophets. No difference there. Our study of the 12 minor prophets will provide us with information concerning not only the men themselves, but also the intimate relationship that bound them to the God of Israel, whom they served and worshiped, and which was the key to their lives and to their uh, ministries. The point to note well, and the subject of this lesson today, is the call, the calling of these men directly by God into the dynamic role of a prophet. We don't talk about that very much. We, you know, in an introductory lesson, we, we say, well, this prophet was called at this particular time, period, and we move on. Or this prophet, uh, the Lord called him in this particular way, and we move on. Today, I, I really want to focus on the idea of the call itself uh, and explore that uh, with you. Our study will uh, outline several characteristics of the divine call in order to gain insight, not only into the prophet, but also into the originator of every call, and that's the Lord himself. What is it about the call that made it so significant in the lives of these men? In addition to this, we're going to review the five elements that we will examine in each of the 12 books of the minor prophets in order to be familiar with the contents in the purpose. So as we go through the 12 prophets, each book, I'm gonna look at five separate elements for each book to give you a, a way to compare the books one to another and uh, to make an easier flow of all the material that we have to cover. Uh, the words used to refer to the prophets in the Hebrew language, roe, which meant seer, or another word, nabi, which meant uh, spokesman or which is translated spokesman or very interesting to bubble, to bubble up. Imagine the, the, uh, the idea of the prophet, a word that meant to, to bubble up. These words were originally used in connection with those who practiced nature religions. You know, people who at a certain time, certain tribes, certain groups of people worship the sun or they worship trees or they worship the river, a river, the river God and the God of the sun, the God of the moon, so on and so forth. Those are what's called nature religions. They worship, you know, things in, in nature. So what I'm saying is these words actually originate in those times. They refer to those kinds of, uh, those kinds of, uh, of, uh, of people uh, who were in the pagan world at that time. So there's a tendency to confuse the history of the word used in describing the Hebrew prophet with the actual practice of his uh, ministry. Originally, the word for prophet suggested elements of divination, magic, and ecstatic trances, which were present in the Canaanite religion with which the Hebrews came into contact when they entered that land early in their settlement and ultimate conquest of the land. They found people, they found religion, they found people who practiced religion, they also found people who were leaders of the religion, and the people who were the leaders of the religion of those, 
those, uh, those tribes, those, those, uh, those pagan tribes used the same words, Roa and Nabi, they used the same words to refer to their magicians and shamans and uh, so on and so forth. However, however, as the Hebrews evolved in their practice of the Jewish religion, the term prophet gained new meaning and significance with the rise and the development of the Hebraic prophetic order. The word prophet came to be understood in light of the unique word work of the Jewish prophet and the position or the role that he began to play in society. I, I guess it's a little bit like um, what I'm trying to explain here. It's a little bit like the word for church. In the New Testament, the word for church, the Greek word for church, ekklesia, ekklesia, uh, meant uh, those who were called out. That's what the word church meant in Greek, those who were called out. And originally that word referred to uh, uh, elders, uh, city leaders. In other words, the, the men who were called out and uh, uh, were given the responsibility to uh, be the city council, the men who sat at the city gate to decide the affairs of the village and the city and, and so on and so forth, they were the ecclesia. But then Jesus began to use that word in reference to his followers, in reference to the body of Christ. And then the apostles began to use that same word, but referring this time to believers in Christ and those who group together as a church, as the called out, uh, uh, as the, the Christians. And eventually that word was exclusively used to refer to the Christian church. It no longer had meaning as, as far as uh, you know, the, the elders of a city or anything like that. So what I'm saying is in the same way, the Jewish word for prophet the Jewish prophets, originally these words were referring to pagans, shamans and witch doctors and so on and so forth. But with time, uh, the Jews appropriated these words and these words exclusively referred to the Jewish uh, prophets. Okay, so Hebrew uh, prophecy in the, is the defining element that eventually separated the Israelite religion from all other contemporary religions and gave it a survival value that these other pagan religions did not possess. Uh, other pagan religions, uh, they had temples, you know, the Jews had temples or a tabernacle. Well, the, the, the pagan tribes, they had temples. Uh, uh, the Jews had priests, well, the, the, the pagans, they had priests. Uh, the Jews offered sacrifice. Well, the pagans, they offered, you know what I mean? Everything that the Jews kind of did, the pagans did as well. They had priests, temples, sacrifices, all kinds of things, uh, similar activities. But there was one thing that the pagan tribes did not have, and that was prophets. Prophets were the defining uh, uh, role in the Jewish religion that completely separated them from uh, pagan worship and pagan practices. The power expressed through the Jewish prophet changed the original word and meaning of the expression used to refer to both the person and his work and ministry. In other words, the Jewish prophet was so powerful, had such an impact on his, uh, 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 on his people uh, that eventually the word uh, uh, was associated with him. He uh, uh, appropriated that word, appropriated that title, uh, 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 because no other religious worker in the pagan world uh, could do what the Jewish prophets could do, and that was to speak from God, to, to uh, you know, speak of the future, and we'll get into that in a, in a moment. So no longer did it suggest a dark and mysterious nether world and associations of strange characters and unseen powers, you know, as it did in the, in the Jewish religion, but rather now this, these words describe the motivating factor that enabled the prophet to do and to say as he did to the people of his time. So this new factor 
was his genuine call by God to be his service, a servant rather, and spokesman. Hence, this ancient term referring to darkness and magic in light of the Hebrew life and experience came to mean the call. The prophet, uh, the words used to describe the prophet also described his experience, his experience of being called uh, uh, by God. Uh, an interesting passage that I, uh, you know, I used to read uh, many times uh, made a lot more sense when I understood the etymology of this word here. Uh, in 1 Samuel 9, 9, it says, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, come and let us go to the seer, using the ancient word that was used with pagan tribes. For he who is called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. And it's interesting that Samuel explains this idea of the, you know, the evolution of this word, referring at one time to you know, pagan uh, witch doctors and shamans now uh, is referring to the Jewish prophet. And the big difference was the Jewish prophet was called by God, okay? So Samuel gives, like I said, the etymology, the history and the development of a word uh, and the change of meaning. And this is very rare. It's very rare that in the Bible you have, you know, the, the writers commenting on the evolution of a word. Very rare to see this. So there's a little bit of background uh, of doing that. We have an example of Samuel explaining the evolution of this word from its pagan roots to the present meaning that it had, you know, and this was what, in the thousand BC roughly. So the meaning changed from shaman and magician, etc., to the one who speaks for God or to the one who is called by God. All right, so there's the, the development of the word uh, used to refer uh, to what we call prophets. Now the prophets lived at different times with different circumstances, but their calling into ministry was similar in that each calling had common characteristics. The calling is what separated the prophet from his people it separated the prophet from his past, and it also separated the prophet from everything else. Once he was called, he was in a new dimension. He was in a, it was a new life. Everything else just faded away once the prophet received his call. And there are uh, similarities or there are certain characteristics of the call, the calling that each of these men had. So we'll take a look at those. First of all, the calling was unique. The call or the calling was unique. In no other religion was there such a phenomenon. None of the pagan religions had this phenomenon that the gods, uh, whoever they worshiped, the tree god, or the sun god, or the, the gods, you know, the whatever gods that they had, uh, selected a certain person to speak on their behalf. That concept did not exist in uh, pagan religion. The nature religions claimed a relationship with the spirit world uh, that was mediated through the shamans and the witches and various priests and magicians. Other more developed religious systems, such as the Greeks and the Romans, uh, had an elaborate panoply of gods and goddesses with lives that were carefully watched and ministered to by temple attendants. However, only in the Hebrew religion was there the religious notion of a single personal God who was moral, who was sovereign, and who was intimately related to man, or mankind if you wish. Furthermore, only in this Hebrew religion did God reveal himself by communicating his emotions, his plans, his will and desires to mankind for its own knowledge of him, as well as for the instruction of the nation in every aspect of their lives. That type of thing just didn't happen in pagan religion. In pagan religions, the key was to keep the gods happy. That, 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 that was the game. No matter what form the god took, 
the goal was to keep the God happy, uh, to make sure that the God was not angry with us. That was the goal. Uh, you didn't get to know who he was. You didn't get further information about you know, what the God thought or you didn't get any of that. Uh, all you received were instructions on how to keep him happy. And if that meant you offered some of your crop or you offered your animals and sacrifice, if it meant you took your firstborn and offered him you know, uh, in, in the fire uh, to, to the gods, well then you did that because that was the goal. Just keep them happy and make sure they don't hurt us. In the Hebrew religion, because we're so used to it, right? We, we, we read the Old Testament, we read about these prophets, we're used to it. But I mean, this was like unheard of. God is speaking to us. He's, he's explaining what he thinks. He's, he's telling us what we should do for our own good to improve our lives. Oh, you know, this, this was, you know, in the Bible, it says the Jewish nation, they were the light unto the Gentiles. I mean, that was not an overstatement. They were a light unto the Gentiles. They, they brought ideas uh, into being uh, through the revelation uh, given by the prophets that just you know, made somebody's head blow up, you know, and using an expression that we use uh, today. Uh, um, the Jewish prophet, unlike his pagan counterpart, did not try to manipulate God. That's what magic is, by the way. Magic is the manipulation of the spirit world by doing things in the physical world. That's what magic is. I have my lucky thing, my lucky thing, whatever it is, my lucky rabbit, my lucky hockey stick, <laughs> my lucky whatever. If I have that, then I have some control, if you wish, over the uh, spirits uh, and they'll give me, quote, good luck. You know, luck and all that business, that's all part of the uh, magic, uh, the practice of, uh, practice of magic. Uh, but in the Jewish religion, uh, man did not try to manipulate God through magic and occult practices, but rather uh, was consumed with the, effort, uh, with the effect that his experience contact with God produced in him. The, 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 the Jewish prophet uh, was not trying to manipulate God. He was trying to deal with his relationship with God and how that affected him and what God wanted him to say or do for the people. That's what consumed the Jewish prophet. Whereas the seers and the priests and the diviners and the magicians of other religions, they sought to understand and placate the gods in order to gain more mastery over their own natural and their cultural environments. The Hebrew prophets continually dealt with the implications directly produced by their call to service. I've been called Something has happened to me that is unearthly, unworldly. It's spiritual in nature. What am I going to do with that? How will I react? What do I do now? Uh, their prayer was, well, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And how they would uh, carry those things out. Of course, this included the transformation that the call produced in their lives. Uh, you were a farmer minding your own business and doing your farm and then all of a sudden you were a prophet or you were a court official uh, doing uh, you know, whatever you do in the royal court and now you're a prophet. Uh, that changed a person's life at that time. There were also the implications brought about by the message that they preached to the people from God. For example, Jeremiah, uh, think of all the things that happened to Jeremiah because of what he said. No one was converted, uh, you know, he preached for how many, how many decades and didn't have any converts, but what happened to him because of his preaching? Well, they threw him down, a, they threw him down an empty well, uh, they put him in stocks in prison, they, you know, they threatened to kill him, all kinds of things that happened to him. And so this need to speak and the tension with the hearers that you were speaking to, this experience was not present in the pagan religious experience between the people and their magicians and their priests. Again, they didn't know anything about that. This was unique to the Jewish prophet, unique to the relationship 
of the prophet with God and the prophet with the people. This was a unique experience, uh, unknown by any other uh, group of uh, people. Okay, secondly, so it was unique. Secondly, it was from God. In Jeremiah 1 and 9, it says, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. A, a very dramatic, picturesque way of saying, now God is going to speak through you, uh, Jeremiah. So the call was from God in the sense that it did not originate from a feeling of moral indignation. Somebody didn't say, I'm going to become a prophet because I see a lot of bad things going on and somebody's got to stand up and talk about this. You know? Well, that may be good and, and you know, a good way to be motivated about stuff, but that, that, did not, that did not constitute a call. The call didn't come from inside the prophet. You understand? Uh, it didn't come from national pride. You know? uh, they can't, that country can't do that to us. I'm going to lead a revolt. I'm going, to, I'm going to lead an army and destroy that other country. You know, that may be fine again, but that wasn't the call of God working. It wasn't either a conscientious concern. Somebody needs to do something about the poor. I'm going to start raising money and to help the poor. Well, again, a good impulse, but that wasn't, that's not what constituted a call from God. The source of the calling was in God, not the prophet. In other words, God was the subject of the call, not the object of the call. Thus, the call had significance for the prophet because its origin was in God. These men did not answer some unknown deity or even their own conscience or the call of their nation. They responded to the direct call of God the God of their fathers, the God of their nation, the God of their history, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the one speaking, calling, if you wish, these prophets. Now, there were many diviners and magicians operating in that era, but the similarities between these people and the prophets were minimal. The major objection of the prophets themselves when compared to these others was that their source was different. Their source, uh, or rather the source of the magician and the diviner's initiative was the diviner or the magician himself or a teacher that had taught him his trade. However, the source of the Hebrew prophet's message was the living God. It didn't come from him, it came from God. And the fact that God was speaking through man created a tension, created a spiritual stress, if you wish, that other individuals did not experience. Therefore, the motivating force for the pagan religious worker was his own initiative, whereas the Hebrew prophet only moved or spoke when God chose to instruct him or put a message onto his heart. And so another characteristic of the prophet's call, it was from God. It didn't come from inside the man himself. Another characteristic, it was powerful. The call was powerful. The power of the call was contained in the fact that until the prophet's contact with God, everything that had been tradition, whether it was ritual or law or worship or feasts, now became alive and relevant and vibrant, like the separate pieces kind of coming together as a whole, giving the individual insight and understanding at a level that not only uh, wipes away all doubt, but gives one joy and peace and courage and a taste of the uh, heavenly kingdom. Haven't we ever had that just for a moment? Have we not read the word at some point and we're reading along and all of a sudden we see something that we've never seen before, 
that sheds light on an idea and we get an insight from God's word and we realize, man, this is the truth. This is how things work. You know? We see it and, and it overjoys. You know, we're overjoyed. We feel a sense of satisfaction and we say, oh God, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. It's so wonderful. You know? And you wish you could hold on to that you know, 24 hours a day. But what happens? The phone rings, uh, the dog barks. Uh, you know, you got, I got to fix supper. You know, life uh, intrudes. Uh, I think God gives us those moments to give us a little taste of what heaven will, would be like. Well, I'm saying this to say that's what was happening to the prophet, but it was happening times a hundred. We, we get a little taste of it, but times a hundred, all of a sudden, because of God's word entering their heart, directly from God, the, 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 the clouds opened up, the, the, the curtain was opened for a moment and they saw the whole, they saw the idea. Uh, you know, uh, they, they got to the point where uh, they could say, go ahead, kill me, whip me, do whatever you want. I can't deny what I've seen. I can't deny what I know. I know God is there. He spoke to me. Yes, beat me some more. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you can't beat it out of me. <laughs> you just can't beat it out of me because I know what I know. I've seen what I've seen. Okay. So uh, this experience of God creates a core crisis, which the prophet tries to convey through his messages that he preaches. That's what gives or gave the prophets the power of their uh, preaching. I want to give you an example of this idea of the core crisis. You may find this unusual. A fish. Uh, stay with me here, OK? A flying fish, uh, a ray thinned fish. It's a cod. These fish here, they're called flying fish. They can propel and leap out of the water and, and jump you know, like 50 yards. They can be in the air for 50 yards to jump. Uh, they're like prophets. Their experience is like the experience of the prophets. Let me explain. These fish, they live in the ocean. They live with all the other fish uh, in the incredibly varied environment that provides all that the fish need as fish to live a full fish life. Then this one fish has the ability to fly out of the water and above the water for a short time. And while in the air, this fish sees a whole new and different world. He sees the sky and the sun, birds, mountains, even other living creatures zooming about above the water uh, with these strange looking creatures. And then that flying fish it goes back in the water. Uh, that fish has had an awakening, uh, a life crisis. Uh, he's had a vision that he can't unsee, an experience that changes his understanding of reality. That fish will never be the same. So he goes back down with the other fish and he tries to explain his experience. <laughs> he tries to preach the gospel of this other world that he has seen. Uh, and his fellow fish, they just don't get it. Why? Uh, because they're not flying fish. They have to take his word for it. You see, what I'm, you see what I'm saying? They can't see the new reality that he has seen because they're just fish. They cannot fly. So uh, back to the prophets. Their call from God gave them a vision that changed their concept of reality. And this crisis was the spiritual fuel that propelled their ministry of prophecy despite hardship and threats of death. Their vision of the new reality kept them faithful to their mission. I read a passage in John, it says, Simon Peter answered to Jesus, you know, when Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? You know, there, were, there was trouble. People were abandoning the Lord. And he said to the apostle, are you going to leave me too? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
you have the words of eternal life. Well, well, what was Peter expressing here? Uh, Peter couldn't unsee or unhear what he had seen. He couldn't unhear what he had heard. He heard the voice of God. He saw the image of God. He witnessed the power of God. I mean, that's why he said, Lord, where am I going to go now? You've ruined me. I can't go back to fishing. <laughs> I can't go back to the old life anymore. I can only go forward. I can only, I can only go with you, Lord. That's the power of the call. That's the power of the call. The clarity and precision of the message which possessed him and the irresistible impulse to speak the message, this carried the conviction that the word had come to the prophet from beyond himself. And so the call was powerful, life-changing. Another characteristic is that the call had a specific purpose. It wasn't just a call, I had an experience, now what do I do? You know, I run around in circles, you know, I get all excited, I grow a long beard, I live in a cave, I, I, I drop out, uh, what do I do? Well, the, the prophet's call had a specific purpose. The power of the call served not only as a witness to the prophet, but it equipped him with power to witness to other people. Even when facing hostile or indifferent audiences, this did not dilute the power and the conviction of the preaching or the message itself. Regardless of the audience and their attitude or the topic, the prophets were uncompromising in their denouncing of sin and unfaithfulness. It took a lot of courage to go in front of the king and tell him, you're doing wrong. God is gonna punish you when the king had the power of life and death over you. The power of the call is what drove the individual to make that pronouncement even under the threat of, of death. These men did not see their calling as a sign to withdraw from society in order to live a solitary life, you know, like a hermit or a monk or something but rather they saw it as a mission to go out and engage with society and bringing people uh, the word and the will of God and to do this whether it was well received or not. You know, uh, the call still exists today. God calls people today. He calls people into ministry today. It still happens. I was just speaking with someone the other day and we were talking about you know, preachers and some of them uh, have been preachers for a long time and others quit uh, you know, five years in or 10 years in, they can't do it anymore. Or, uh, uh, why, why do, the, why do they stay? You know, and, I, and my answer was, well, because we have a calling. We, we have a calling. Uh, I was a sales manager for a big corporation and then uh, you know, God called me to preach the gospel. Uh, I didn't even understand what the gospel was really. I'd never been to a church of Christ, never been to Sunday school, never been to Bible school, never been to church camp, never been to a gospel meeting, never been to a seminar, never been to a lectureship. No, I knew nothing of that. The only thing I knew was what I was reading in my Bible. And to me, traveling on a subway, listening to a couple of young women talking about their boyfriends, moving in with them and drinking and which club they were gonna to go to on the weekend and you know, birth control so they, so they didn't get in trouble. You know, and and, and this, was the, this was the substance of their life. And in my head, I, it was like, these guys are, don't have a clue about what life is all about. I had just become a Christian. I was a young Christian, maybe a year, year and a half. And I said, man, somebody has got to tell these people, you know, they, they don't know the gospel. And I'm telling you right now, I mean, it happened more than 40 years ago. You know, in my heart, it says, why don't you go? Why not you? You speak the language, you believe the gospel. 
That's the only thing that carries you for 40 or 50 years in ministry. Those of you who serve as elders or deacons or deacons' wives or whatever, you know that it's not easy. In the church, it's very, it's a difficult work. So it's not the money that carries you, it's not the quote prestige that carries you, no. It's the call. I hear people say, how come we don't have enough preachers nowadays? What's going on? Why aren't the colleges cranking out more preachers? Well, it's not the job of the college to crank out preachers. What we should be praying for is God, please start calling men into ministry. Start calling women into ministry. That's what we should be praying for. Uh, a person who's called by God will find a way to get an education. Will find a way to get training. I mean, uh, we were married, we had little kids, we had no money, we still found a way. Found a way to go to OC and get some training. You know, we found a way, God found a way. And so uh, the characteristics of the prophets call specific purpose. God has a specific purpose in mind. Another characteristic is that it's not transferable. Only God had or has the authority and power to call. Prophets had followers or helpers, you know, Elisha, Elijah had Elisha, for example, uh, and they mentored and taught others. Paul taught Timothy and, uh, and Epaphroditus and so on and so forth. But these individuals could not pass along their original call. I can't go up to somebody and say, God is calling you. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have that power. Only God calls. Also, even though his calling was the spiritual core that motivated the prophet, it was not the focus of his ministry. The focus of his ministry was conveying God's word and will to his people. The call is attention attention, not attention, but a tension, T-E-N-S-I-O-N, a tension that exists within the individual who's called. And the call, that tension between, it's between the prophet and God. For their whole life, that, that tension exists, stays. You have to just deal with it. But that isn't the subject of the preaching. The preaching is the preaching of God's word, not the preaching of your call. That's between you and God. Only the results of the call were visible and meaningful to other people. The call itself was meaningful and understood only by the prophet. It was a personal thing. Number six, the call was accompanied by signs at that time. The call provided a powerful spiritual experience for the prophet, but was also accompanied by supernatural activity done by him as well as experienced by him. He had dreams, he had visions, he had insights that he shared. I've listed a couple of examples, you know, Samuel, the miracle of the rain and thunder to validate his words to Israel. Ezekiel had visions, Daniel dreams, and he interpreted dreams, and he had visions, and so on and so forth. Moses, visual effects, miracles, the voice of God. Isaiah showed signs, and he had visions. The signs confirmed both the prophet's calling as well as his ministry. Also, the punishment for false or unfulfilled prophecy was death. We know that. Deuteronomy 18 says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak or which he speaks in the name of an, another God, that prophet will die. So they had a way of trimming out the fakes back in the day <laughs> in the Old Testament. <laughs> if you just appointed yourself as a prophet and shot your mouth off on something and it didn't happen, you were dead. So that kind of, you know, that kind of discouraged uh, people from uh, thinking they could you know, uh, appoint themselves as prophets of God. And then uh, finally, the call changed the man into the prophet. There was a process. First, it called on him uh, to believe. 
the prophet was the first one to believe that he was being called by God to serve as a prophet. This was the basis on which he relied to call upon others to believe his message. The call separated him. He was now separated from the world and this prepared him to mediate the message of God to the people of God with him in between. The single most common thing uh, that all ministers share is that they have few friends. They have few friends. It, it is a solitary existence. Why? Because it separates you from other people. The call also make the prophet, made the prophet responsible. The burden of God's call and responsibility to bring God's word to the people made them acutely aware of the effect of their conduct on the people. You know, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 9, 16? Woe am I if I don't preach? The prophets felt the burden of responsibility to preach. You ever wonder why 90 year old uh, retired prophets who can barely remember their names still want to get up and say something? They want to get up and say a long prayer and they preface it with a word of encouragement and an exhortation at the end, you know, when all you've asked them to do is just open. Uh, I'm sitting there, I usually tell my wife, yeah, preachers got to preach. Yeah. Preachers got to preach. It's just one of those things, you know. This in turn, of course, made them painfully aware of their own sinfulness and their need for God's mercy. What did Paul say? I'm the chief sinner. Imagine, here's a guy who's written 50% or more of the New Testament and planted churches, done miracles, raised the dead, and he's still saying, I am the chief sinner? Yeah, he was very much aware of his own sin. See, the more you see God, the more you see your own sinfulness. That's the trade-off. That's the trade-off. People who don't see their own sinfulness, they don't see God very much. So the deeper you go with God, the more you see your own sinfulness. That's, that's the dichotomy. That's the pain of it. That's why Paul could say he was aching to be out of his body and to be with God. Not because he was a widower or single or whatever and he hated the life, it's just uh, he, he knew God so well that it revealed his own sinfulness to such an extent that it was unbearable. And so he wanted to be with God. You want to be with God, sure, sometimes because you've got a sore back or you're suffering from cancer or whatever. Of course, that's human nature. But he wanted to be with God because he was just tired of carting around his sinful flesh, you know, enough already. So the calling did not confer the ability to be impervious to temptation or sin or failure. You still were a sinful man. If anything, the call forced the prophets to make a greater effort at holy living. That was true then and it's, it's true now for those who are called. The call also produced a struggle inside of the prophet. The nature of the call was divine and the ability to accept or refuse the call created anxiety in the individual. Rejecting, the, the, uh, rejecting to call would produce regret. You know, if you rejected the call, it would produce regret and second guessing. And then accepting the call would produce doubt. You know, can I do this? Is this really real? As well as fear. What will people think of me? What will people do? Those opposing feelings created anxiety and emotional strain among the prophets. Prophets became men of prayer in order to cope with this emotional and spiritual uh, strain. Uh, the, the, the reaction that I got when, when I said that I was going into ministry was laughter. Laughter. You? <laughs> you? <laughs> Pretty much. You can fill in the blanks. You? 
And then for the most part, the people saw prophets as called the Jewish uh, people. All true prophets were considered called by God in the eyes of the people. This from the knowledge of their call and the way the calling gave power to their messages. And this was so even if they disagreed with the prophet's message or simply chose to disregard it, they still believed he was a prophet. A good example of this is Jeremiah. The king and the people continually rejected his message of warning and his demands to repent. But no one doubted that he was a prophet called by God. They didn't obey, they didn't listen, they didn't pay attention. They put him in jail, they put him in stocks, they threw him down a well, they, they threatened to kill him. <laughs> but they believed he was a true prophet of God. They just didn't want to hear. They didn't want to heed his warnings from God until it was too late. And we know the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and carried away the people into exile in 538 uh, BC. So the call experience of the Old Testament prophets initiated, supported, and confirmed their ministry to God's people. And we said that the call had uh, certain features. It was unique. It was unlike anything else in any other religion. It was divine. God called. He was the source. There were no self-appointed prophets. Just like in the church today, there are no self-appointed ministers. There are no self-appointed deacons. There are no self, there's, no, there's no man that gets up one day and says, you know, I believe, I, I think I'd be a good elder. I believe I'm going to call, my, I'm going to appoint myself as elders and I'll just put that in the announcements. You know, we'd laugh at that, but I mean, it follows the same thing. You no, know, everyone, everyone in a position of leadership in the church is appointed. So, uh, It was a divine call, not a personal call. It was powerful. It provided spiritual fuel for the journey to serve God. It was specific. It raised up men to speak for God. It was not transferable. Only God did the calling, not the individuals. It was accompanied by signs, a divine call with divine proof. And it was a change agent, God's call changed a believer into a prophet, changed a follower into a leader. Okay, so that's our lesson for today. I wanted to spend some time on the call so we're a little more sensitive to these, to these prophets and these ministers of God, what they experienced. Our next lesson, we're gonna begin our study of Hosea and we're going to examine, remember I said five elements each book. So each book we're going to talk about the prophet himself, the time frame when he lived, the situation, the message that he was uh, uh, promoting. We're going to outline and commentary or make comments about the book itself and then draw some practical lessons for today. So that's how we're going to go through each uh, uh, book. Your assignment uh, will be, of course, to read the book of Hosea. And the way we work it, I was, uh, Dan and I were talking about this before, is you read the book first, so you just read it on your own, you know, just read it. Then in class, we're going to go through it and we're going to explain and give you some details. And then I'm going to ask you to read it again the following week. And your second reading of that book will make a whole lot more sense. Uh, will give you uh, much more uh, information uh, because of what we've discussed in class. And we're doing it this way because we don't have the time to do a line by line study of each book uh, and to do that in 10 lessons, impossible, okay? So that's ours for today. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for your attention, appreciate it.